My name is Lina Beydoun, Director of Development at the American University in Cairo, New York office. I wish to thank you for joining us today for an exciting presentation featuring the remarkable work and creativity of AUC professors Bahia Shahab and Haytham Nawar. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to type any questions you may have for the panelists in the Q&A at the bottom of your screens. Today's event is part of a series of webinars that AUC in North America will be hosting throughout the year, highlighting the amazing talents of our faculty and alumni. Please stay tuned for more webinars to come. Our speakers today will discuss the recent co-authored book, A History of Arab Graphic Design, which is published by the AUC Press. We will share the link to purchase the book at a discounted rate in the chat box. I will now turn it over to Nadia Naqib, who will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. Nadia is Senior Commissioning Editor at the AUC Press, where she acquires scholarly and general interest books in Middle East studies. The floor is yours, Nadia. Thank you all. Thank you, Lina. Thank you. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to be moderating this webinar on a history of Arab graphic design which is uh, the title of this book published by the AUC Press. Um, uh, I would, uh, there will be time to ask questions uh, after discussion, so please type your questions, as Lena said, in the Q&A beneath uh, as we go. So without further ado, let me introduce our speakers. Um, Bahia Shahab is Professor of Design and founder of the Graphic Design Program at the American University in Cairo. Her work has been shown in museums, galleries, and, and streets around the world. Um, she was the first Arab woman to receive the UNESCO Sharjah Prize for Arab Culture. Um, her books uh, include You Can Crush the Flowers, a visual memoir of the Egyptian Revolution, and A Thousand Times No, a visual history of the Lamb Elif. Haytham Nawar is Associate Professor of Design and the Chair of the Department of the Arts at the American University in Cairo and a practicing artist and designer. He's also the founding director of Cairotronica, the Cairo International Electronic and New Media Arts Festival. And his most recent book is Language of Tomorrow Towards a Multicultural Visual Communication System in a Post-Human Era. Um, so uh, let's start. Um, I would like to uh, ask Bahia and Haytham a question. Uh, first question, which is uh, quite a basic one. Um, what is graphic design from your perspective? And how did you come to be graphic design instructors? Uh, okay, I will, I will start with uh, answering the, the second part of your question, which is how did I become a graphic design instructor? Actually, I studied graphic design at the American University in Beirut. I graduated in 99, uh, I was the fourth class, one of the members of the fourth class to graduate from a new program. I had really brilliant professors who were very inspiring, who created uh, an atmosphere of learning, but also of curiosity. Um, and we were always looking for what is Arab identity and what is graphic design. And I was stunned not to find any references on the history of uh, graphic design. We studied mainly Western centric or Eurocentric uh, narratives. And I was always questioning where is our history? Where are our um, designers? So um, I worked in advertising for a few years and then I shifted careers and joined the academia. And with that question in mind, who are our uh, grand who are our design grandparents? So to me, that has been a, a question that has been brewing for a long time. I let Haysam answer the second part, and then we move on to what is graphic design. Thank you, Nadia, for your question. I mean, my story is a little bit different than Bahia because I was formally uh, uh, trained as a as a as a, a printmaker, like a, a, a visual artist. So I graduated from the fine art in the year the, from uh, the school of fine art in Zamalek, and that was the year two thousand from the printmaking uh, uh, department. And I was not really intention intentionally wanted to work as a graphic designer either to be a design educator, and I was just only want to be a visual artist and. Uh, 
And uh, but I was commissioned few jobs uh, when I was in the third and the fourth year of the study, and then. Uh, like Bahia, I worked for a couple of years in advertising after graduation. And then I applied for a, a job as a teaching assistant in um, one of the private universities in Egypt in 2001. And then I discovered the world of graphic design. I, I, I was trained with, I, I would call him the master guru of design in, in the state universities, Mahmoud Semi. And uh, I learned from him how to design, how to teach graphic design, and uh, I had a kind of career shift with a passion to teach design because of, of Mahmoud Sami from 2000, and now it's 20 years being teaching graphic design. Yeah, so to answer what is graphic design now, if you, if you can go to the first uh, slide, we'll just go quickly, very roughly, uh, what is graphic design. So graphic design is now uh, is is a really difficult term to to uh, we historically it has evolved or what it means but we have some examples of earlier examples where of logos and um, um, and um, cinema announcements. Um, yeah, and this is the first part where where we're showing these two examples, and then it could also be uh, our direction for ads or calendars like in the in these examples uh, from Algeria it could be street sign it could be the cover of the bible or the quran this, this is things that people do not consider to be uh, graphic design it could also be um, um, mastheads of newspapers it could be book covers uh, again street signs these are examples from Egypt by Said Ibrahim um, they could be magazines. It could be a magazine cover for children or grown-ups and the inside design of, of a magazine. So what, what Jabahia, just again, so the contribution from before the definition of graphic design, which is uh, the contribution of calligraphers or the typesetters and the print, uh, printing presses or uh, illustration and graphical art within publication industry, such as uh, magazine and newspapers, if it's for adults or for children, that, that's all defined as, as graphic design. And that's what graphic design uh, for us, that what, what we included in the, uh, in the book. Uh, sorry, Bahia, yeah. I saw the <laughs> Yeah, it's, no, it's fine. It could be a typography. So type designers, also some of them uh, start as, as uh, study as graphic designers. Um, so these are some examples from Letraset, which was, if some of you are older, you would remember them. They're the transfer sheets uh, for um, uh, the layout of magazines or newspapers. So these were used to design uh, uh, mastheads and um, headlines. It, and it could go up to be uh, the design of a plane. So it's everything in between, it's, uh, it can be a small logo to a very big design and it, it has branched out and it started by, and I think Hesam can also speak about the role in the beginning of calligraphers and artists. There was no discipline of graphic design per se, but then the need rose um, after the industrial revolution and the, and the world wars, there was a need to communicate um, to a greater audience and the need for graphic design was born. Yeah, so just to, when, when, when the artist needed to produce for the masses artwork, so beginning of like artist with no formal education, I think Nadia will ask a question about the, the, the education of graphic design, but also calligraphers and the contribution to communicate again with the masses through uh, um, the example that we show. Um, until they would become a formal, I would say, science of graphic design. Of, um, and okay, well, that's a good lead into into my next question, Haytham, um, which is a, one of the uh, features, one of the main themes that comes across in a history of Arab graphic design uh, is the role of institutions in creating graphic designers. And by institutions, I mean uh, newspapers, publishing houses, magazines, as well as more formal um, uh, institutions of learning like art colleges and universities. So 
my question is where did many uh, pioneering designers learn their craft uh, and or what were the leading schools, if you will, of uh, graphic design uh, and how does the um, ecosystem of design differ from the ecosystem of art? So, you know, could you maybe say, say something about that as well? Um, and maybe what is it about graphic art, in your opinion, that elevates it to art? I, maybe that's a slightly separate question. Okay, so I, I will, uh, here, let me answer this question. I will divide this, this, um, this question to two parts. One is the formal education of art and design, and the one is the informal education. So the formal education is such uh, art and design schools. And they will highlight, I mean, the, we, we did in the, in the book cover, most of the of the art schools, but I will highlight uh, some of the very important ones in terms of uh, the contribution of the graduates from, from that school. So we have the fine art school in, in Zamalek, which was established in 1908. And here the image that you see, that's Mohammed uh, uh, Nagy, which is the first Egyptian dean of the school because it was the, the former deans were actually uh, uh, British, French, and Italians. And uh, why I mentioned the school, because many of the graduates that we been uh, uh, highlighted in the book, they're actually coming from the fine art school in Zemalik. There is also 19, um, sorry, 1839 is the applied art school in, uh, in, in Egypt, it was called actually the school of uh, technical operations that was also uh, after Muhammad Ali uh, Pasha uh, sending uh, uh, scientists and, and the engineer, but also artists to go and, and learn in, in Europe and then come back and establish that school. But we have also 1960, the Fine Art School in Damascus, 1946, uh, um, the Casablanca School in, in Morocco, and also the College of Fine Art uh, in Baghdad in 1940. So those are major art schools, which not really yet designed. They are art schools. They're actually teaching artists like painting, drawing, printmaking, uh, uh, and similar uh, 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 traditional format. But then when there is a need, for people to come and work outside, not just being art, but working in uh, like an as, as an artist that work also in um, uh, newspapers and magazine. So they actually working for living commission jobs. So they started actually to do work for many of the magazines and newspapers in the Arab world. And here I will jump to the, the second part of the informal education, which actually coming with a skill of drawing or painting. And then you move to an institution such as uh, Dail Hilal, for example. And when you go there, you learn design, you learn the art direction for, uh, you learn how to do, uh, uh, how to organize a page, or how to design a cover. So you have from Dail Hilal, which was established in, and I just also, again, I will mention very few ones that really very important as, as an art school, which is Dail Hilal, 1892, many of the publication came out of Dail Hilal, which is very important, uh, like Megalit uh, Al-Hilal, the Hilal magazine, or Al Musawwar, Al Kawakib, the famous uh, Samir, and those many of the artists working there, like uh, Munir Kanaan, Mustafa Hussain, Lakha, uh, Bikar, uh, and also we have Rosa Yusuf and Sabah Al Khair, which everybody knows about Rosa Yusuf and Sabah Al Khair. Rosa Yusuf was 1925, Sabah Al Khair, the baby of Rosa Yusuf, which is 1951. And many, again, many of the artists like Labed, Bahaguri, Abdul Ghani Abu Lanin, uh, Hassan Fouad, Nagy Shekel. So those are actually artists mentioned in, in, in our book. And those are uh, the, the graduates of this, uh, this kind of school. So whether it's uh, uh, um, a traditional format of, of learning in, in art school, like the ones I mentioned before, or actually coming by, learning by working in the field of uh, journalism. So that's how it started actually uh, the, the education of, of design in the art world. What, what does the training landscape for graphic designers look like now in the 21st century in, in the region, do you think? I would like to hear you to-, to Yeah, it's, uh, yeah to I think, yeah, it's the reason why we stopped the book at the year 2000 is, is really, it's a completely different landscape. 
Uh, I said I graduated from the American University in Beirut. At the time, we thought we were one of the pioneering, uh, pioneering programs. After my research, I did, our, our research, we discovered that in 1973, there was an Arabic type design in Sudan program by uh, pioneering calligraphers and designers from Sudan who went and, studies and, sent, and studied in Central St. Martins in London, came back to Khurtum and created programs. So there, there were ecosystems being created with the influx or or outflux of talents and designers who were coming in and coming back uh, to the Arab world, uh, bringing knowledge, setting up uh, programs in Iraq, in Maghrib, in Sudan, uh, mainly Syria and Lebanon, Egypt, of course, uh, we divided in the book uh, several generations of designers and you, we discovered that some of the design pioneers in the region were actually fr uh, from Egypt due to the scale, to the, to the publishing industry, to the writing industry, the, to the cinema industry that was here. It was a fertile ground for designers. But the educational institutions now, um, post-war Lebanon uh, had a few very successful programs that created a big impact on the region. Uh, and then uh, also in Damascus, the, there are uh, good programs. Eventually countries in the Gulf state and the Arabian Gulf states also started uh, developing design programs there. Um, in Morocco now, there is a good school for design and there are a few schools of design in Cairo. So really it has, the landscape has really shifted in the past 20 years and uh, there are more and more um, design graduates coming out of the Arab world with professional um uh, education thank you um and just uh, sorry nadia to interrupt you but i just uh, stopped with the with the Cairo school and i was actually preparing two a couple of slides more but sorry for that because i was <laughs> so much to answer and just to mention the names and the images the bilkahia and shaba and uh, el milihi with the casablanca school in morocco and this is the George Zidane, the founder and the, the current building and actually the old building of Dar al-Hilal in, in, uh, in Muqtadayan in, uh, here in, the, in, in Cairo. Thank you. Um, well, I also remember from our earliest discussions when you were still um, traveling uh, around the region and doing, uh, carrying out your research, I remember the stories you told me about um, your meetings with uh, many designers um, and th th they were very moving stories. And I, I wondered if you could tell us, tell the, our, our viewers a bit about those stories because I loved them um, and how, how they received you when you told them that you were um, uh, doing this, this uh, working on this book. Uh, thank you for this question. It's, uh, it was, oh. It was an extremely emotional journey, at least for me. Hassam remembers how many times I had to stop interviews, walk out of the room, cry, and then come back, continue the conversation. And I did this in several cities uh, while we were interviewing uh, designers uh, because design is very much, I mean, linked to the so it's society, it's ecosystem, it's the politics of the region. It's all, I mean, we touch a lot on that in the, in the book, but some of the stories, um, uh, Haysam, if you want to move on so that we share um, um, a slide, I, I want to start by talking about Kamil El Baba, who's to me, he's everybody we asked uh, would tell us he is a prolific calligrapher, educator. Uh, um, he published uh, the, this book, Ruh uh, al Arabi. So he was really a very important figure. And we were very saddened not to find uh, his work because his son continued the craft, but none of that material was documented, all his work. Um, I mean, you had to work like um, longer hours and, and look in different archives that we did not have the opportunity to do um, within our scope of research. But Kamil El Baba is also, I mean, he deserves a whole book on his own. He worked on calligraphy for um, mosques, churches, books, um, uh, magazines. We, we, I mean, we mentioned here in Nahar, I'm sure uh, if our viewers are familiar with newspapers in Lebanon would know on Nahar, he scribed the logo. This is one of the most known uh, logos um, in the publishing industry uh, in the Levant. So Kamil El Baba's story was a very also 
emotional story uh, for me to to witness that the, the potential of what could have been in the book but is not there so this is this is one uh, story hi sam to add but to just clarify a little bit because we have his calligraphic like classical calligraphy work but we don't have his contribution to the field of graphic design so even that his son is a calligrapher as well but we didn't have the chance to find his work as a, like as a calligrapher as a contribution for graphic design um i will move to another um, also story which is um uh, when I was looking, we know that Hassan uh, Fouad uh, is uh, one of the founders of uh, the magazine Sabah Al Khair. And he actually he worked with uh, uh, plenty of newspapers and, and magazines in, in Egypt. Uh, he worked also for cinema. He worked like writing, writing scripts. He did also uh, 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 scenarios, stories. Like he's an artist doing covers, he's a, a journalist. But uh, um, when, we, when we looked at Hassan Fouad archive, we didn't find anything. We know about the name Hassan Fouad from, the, from Ozil Yusuf, but even going to Ozil Yusuf itself, it was very difficult to find. I mean, I could just tell the, the store here in downtown Cairo when I asked about Hassan Fouad, which is one of the founders of Sabah Al-Khir, the guy in the store, he didn't know actually who is Hassan Fouad. And it was very sad not to find any of the material of Hassan Fouad anywhere, even the, 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 the magazine of like association he established, it was not there. None of the family members have has anything. And uh, we know that there is a lot of contribution for Hassan Fouad, but nothing, which is similar to other stories. And I will jump here to the second slide because that's the, the key of how did, how did we find uh, uh, the material of Hassan Fouad. So the, one of the very early books, uh, uh, not really very really early, but I mean mid, mid 80s, when Mohideen al uh, because he loved Hassan Fouad, he was his uh, uh, teacher, but at the same time friend, he wrote a book about uh, Hassan Fouad. And luckily, the, all the material that was actually the original material from Hassan Fouad dedicated to uh, Mohideen al when I was interviewing Ahmed al the son of Mohideen al he said, like, you know what? I have all the material my father used to write the book about Hassan Fouad. And that was the only door to find the material of Hassan Fouad from the uh, Mohideen Labad collection. So again, and I put here Mohideen Labad again, one of the, also, um, he was the student of Bikar, Hassan Fouad, Abdul Salam al but he's, he's a school by, by himself. So Labad, he was, uh, started working with Sindibad uh, when he was 19 years old and uh, uh, worked also in Sabah al-Khir after the found, uh, founding Sabah al-Khir. But it's a good example of uh, uh, a legacy that uh, his son kept Ahmed al Labad with all the work of, of, uh, of al Labad. And uh, because also al Labad was the bookmaker or the son al Qutub. So, luckily, we have a lot of material for Labad. That's another success uh, story of, uh, of work. So actually, just to build on what Haysam is saying, is, is that for the sad stories of lost archives, this is one, one, one story where we, there, there, we were lucky to find designers who were so concerned and who were so worried about this heritage that they, they managed to hide some of the things. So even if the family of the designer did not retain the archive of that designer or did not see importance in um, uh, keeping the archive of the designer, we found contemporaries, students, uh, concerned colleagues who managed to preserve some of these books and share them with us. So we were also lucky in that sense. So another uh, really beautiful story to share is Burhan Karkutli, who was uh, uh, originally from Damascus, but he identified as Palestinian. So uh, who, whenever he would exhibit his work, he would tell them I'm actually Palestinian because he really cared about the Palestinian cause and he was very concerned. His work was not commercial, uh, so he would uh, display these beautiful drawings and then he would invite the representative of the PLO in any country he's exhibiting to uh, join him for the opening of his exhibition. Um, Burhan settled, uh, studied in Cairo and we found beautiful letters that he wrote to his friends back in Cairo. So he was, he didn't, he couldn't afford more than one letter because he couldn't, he didn't have the money. So he would write one letter to all of them 
and he would ask them to read it all together. And, and that's the letter he posted from Spain. So what was also beautiful is finding the stories and the friendships and the relationships between these designers and the causes that they cared about. Uh, Burhan eventually, and he had this really graphic description of where, uh, when he went to Europe and started reflecting on the, the situation in the Arab world, he has this line that was so strong. He said, we, we're like rats. And I walk on these streets with these beautiful museums and beautiful um, vitrines of, of these shops. And I still ponder on our state in the Arab world as artists and designers, how we don't have any infrastructure for that. And this was 50, 60 years ago. And we still find resonance of his words till today. He died in Germany because he lived in exile away from uh, Syria. Uh, and again, another story of his friends documenting his work in a beautiful book uh, about his, his life and another book in Germany, but only there are only two books about Burhan Kar Karkutli, who I also feel as a school and deserves more books about him. Uh, so that's, that's uh, the story of Burhan. You can tell them also the nice story that we figured out that uh... Some of the books are published in 2013, the one by the Minister of Culture in Syria, that we figure out some of the images when he was a student in Cairo, and it was exactly the building in front of where I was used to live in, in Zamalek. In the and same I'm street. There. So Burhan lived in the same street as Haysam was living when we were doing the research. So that was very, it's, it's also very nice. Mm -hmm. Like he's standing on the balcony overlooking Haysam's house. So it was really amazing to see. Nice coincidence. Um, also from Palestine, uh, Bahia, would you like to talk about uh, Kamal Bulata? Yes, Kamal. Kamal is uh, originally actually from Palestine, but also he moved to the U.S., moved around the world. Uh, this is one beautiful example of his Kufic uh, calligraphy work, La Ana Illa Ana. It's a really, it's a beautiful statement and the work is really uh, beautiful. Uh, he co also worked in Beirut, moved around a lot, uh, was a brilliant scholar, published one of the, I think the first book on the history of Palestinian art, um, but also was a designer who was active. He would print out, um, he would, he told us that he would print out um, posters, join marches in, in Washington, rallying for the cause. He also moved around a lot, his archive moved a lot, and eventually he settled again in Germany, and we had one scholar interview him for us. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. Hezam, would you like us to mention how many designers have passed away since we started uh, our research? I think around... Um... Yeah, unfortunately, we have eight of them passed during the, the, the period of the... Uh, of actually, not the research, from the period of the publishing. Since we submitted the manuscript to uh, to AUC Press and till the book is out, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, eight of them passed away. That's so sad. So we we really feel like we really feel like we 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 were like catching the last story before the story goes. And to us, that was very precious to be able to talk to them, to to transfer their story, just to to honor them in the book. That was very precious also. Yeah, and just to mention that we were really in a hurry once the book is out, that actually to outreach the, the living ones and give them a copy of the book and show what we did. It was really important because we felt the pressure of like responsibility. We need to <laughs> to to show them that there is somebody actually, uh, the, 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 the important work was published actually in, in, uh, in, in, um, in, um, in the Arab world. Get it out into the world. Yeah. What was there something uh, that, that surprised you? Did you have a, about your research? Was there any something that really surprised you during the course of your research? Any anything that just uh... and to me, I think it's the next slide. Hi, Sam. Next slide is is uh, uh, the very but. Uh... Yeah, do you want to talk about the Iraqi school? Because there's a few stories that are really very, very powerful. So maybe, Haysan, you can talk about Dia and I can talk about Rafia. Yeah, so Dia al Azawi, which is uh, again one of the masters, I mean, the, as Bahia mentioned, I mean, the Iraqi designers, they're great. I we just give examples, but I will even just mention names Dia al Azawi, Hashim Samarji, Yahya Sheikh, 
Yehudat Hasib, I don't want to forget names, but we should, we should just only some examples. So Dual Azawi is one of the great, uh, he is one of the great Iraqi artists and designer. He still live at the moment in, in London and working there mostly as, a, as an artist. But uh, Dual Azawi is the, is the archive of the Iraqi art and design. So Iraq, Dia provided us with a 60 years of graphic design in Iraq. And he published actually the first book about Iraq, maybe first and last book about Iraqi poster design, uh, because he was so concerned in the time when he was uh, the director of the Iraqi Culture Center in, in London. Uh, so he was so keen of actually uh, also not just only having uh, um, um, uh, fine art exhibitions, but also posters uh, exhibition in solidarity with different uh, 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 global causes, but and also the publishing. So he was also involved with Nazim Amzi and all his friends like Rafa Al Masri and Salah Al Jumayi and and uh, um, Hashim Samaji of publishing plenty of books about the Arab world, uh, like Funun Arabiya uh, and Mawaqif and many others. So uh, once we, uh, uh, I mean, I was, the, I was lucky and fortunate to go into London and meet him in person. He, we had a little chat and then he opened his archive for me, like giving me all the material that we can actually use in the book. And later on, I think one year later, we met him in Beirut for a book signing uh, of his uh, monograph uh, uh, in, in, um, in Source of Museum published book by Khat Foundation. So it was, uh, one of the successful nice story of like a, a living archive of the Iraqi modern art and design. Yeah, actually, okay. yes. And this, this I want to talk about the other side. Rafa Nasri yesterday was his, um, um, the memory of his 81st uh, birthday. He passed away in 2013. And Dia Hazawi actually published a whole magazine yesterday online for free to everybody about the whole life of Rafa al Nasri. And really, it was so touching for me to see it because he summarized all of Rafa's journey. So, this is the kind of scholar and dedicated designer that, um, uh, that Dia is. Uh, it was really beautiful to read and it was only posted yesterday. But when we met with uh, May, his, his wife in Amman, uh, she, and this is one of the interviews where I really, I, I cried, I couldn't because she told me, uh, we moved from Iraq after the invasion and we settled in Amman and we have all of our archive here. Um, we don't know where we're going to keep it. We don't have children. I don't know what I'm going to be doing. We can't go back to, uh, Iraq, but we live in Amman, our work is here, which institution, like where do we go from here? So it was the, really this, uh, this existential question after these designers who are living in the diaspora because of the wars, because of the invasions, because of uprisings, what is the human condition and the, the way that they are really um, Str struggling with their narratives and how to continue their narratives to me was very emotional and touching to see. I can also speak of Ahmad Lamalla, who when I uh, when I went to Damascus for uh, for the to interview designers in Damascus, every uh, one of the older generation told me you have to interview Ahmad Lamalla, and I kept looking for him and until I found him in Paris. I wrote to him. And I told him, Ahmed, everybody's saying we have to feature your, and he's from the younger generation, so he's in his 50s. And he sent me a picture of his burnt um, studio. And, uh, and I re again, again, it was just so painful for, for me to see. He told me all my life's work was burnt. And, uh, and then he reached out to friends and he started looking and we managed to really represent him in the book. We're very lucky that we, we found his work and it's in the book. But for a few months, he was just um, under the shock that all his work was burnt. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's another story. Hi, Sam. I mean, I, I feel like we are running a little bit out of time, but so I'll go quickly um, uh, because uh, I know that uh, Nadia has many questions, but just as again, Hashim Samaji and his beautiful uh, hospitality, his wife, his, uh, and his son, in, in again in the suburbs of London, they, how they hosted us and how they were very generous of giving us 
all the material that we needed about uh, his contribution to the field of graphic design in, in Baghdad, uh, and then even after he left Baghdad in the 80s to, to London. Um, another story from Iraq, Mohammed Saeed Sagar was a, a brilliant uh, a calligrapher and type designer. And here you can see he was trying to solve the problem of printing and cutting down on the number of thousands of letter, uh, uh, metal lead uh, 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 letters that were contained in for the Arabic printing and before the invention of the computer. So he invented this beautiful solution of uh, creating roots for letters. And then when you combine these roots, you get new letters. So instead of having 28 uh, letters and their or 29 letters and their variations you would have only 17 so it was a genius solution to cut down on the uh, lead cases but um, he was attacked he was accused of being as um, uh, uh, well, his fonts looked like uh, they accused him of uh, being as um, uh, affiliating with uh, the spy he's a spy of uh... Yeah. By because the, the 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 simplification of the way how he changed the Arabic letters looks like Hebrew, so <laughs> they accused him. To be some of the fonts they they distorted his fonts. They accused him, and then he had um, he had an informant live with him in his house for a whole year, and then after that year he was devastated. He left and went and settled in Paris on his 80th birthday. He was honored at the Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, and then he passed away. Uh, a few weeks later, but that's another story of when designers try to innovate and the system does not accept them and they're expelled out of their homeland uh, because they are they have new ideas that the, their community is not ready for. So that was another um, story. Uh, last story for this question is just Mohammed Hajji, which he was born in Mansoor in 1940. Mohammed Hajji is now uh, living in, in Cairo. But with his, uh, um, I mean, again, he's also from the school of, of Sabah al Khair, and, but his contribution to the field of graphic design and, and art in general, especially in stations, like plenty of books, and, uh, and especially also for. Uh, uh, but I mean, I, the story, what I'm really concerned about this part in our, and for the question is actually his, his, um, his political interest. So, Hamad Hajji did do a beautiful book uh, uh, criticizing regimes and political system, which called Shmali Min was published, limited edition published in Tunisia. And then when he wanted to publish it again, like in a, in a bigger, in, in, in Egypt here, it was actually ejected until the moment you speak, it's not allowed to publish this book. Yeah, or it's, the, not allowed, yeah it's not, it's a censored book. Yes, and then there was actually two other books that one about, no, three other books, one about the, uh, the 1973, uh, war and then the book also is not published. Even uh, uh, Mohammed Hajji's brother actually died in the war of 1973, but they didn't allow him to publish the book. Another book is actually an artist translation, uh, sorry, an artist reading to the Quran. And again, the book was uh, uh, again censored one more time that not to be published. And lastly, about the Palestinian cause, which he beautifully uh, designed hundreds of posters for the Palestinian cause, but also his book about designs for Palestine was not uh, published. So uh, that's not, uh, no, I mean, again, his work will live forever. I don't think history will forget the work of Mohammed Hajji, but we hope one day we can actually publish this work. The, the, the book actually, uh, Shumel Yamin, we came, or the first time I saw it was actually in, a, in, a, in Rabat. We, I found it, the first time I came across it was in Morocco, not in Cairo. Maybe because it was published in Tunisia, so it was much closer. <laughs> Thank you, Nadia, for the question. I'm sorry if we actually, our, our answer was really long. That's very interesting. Thank you. Um, well, you, you've, in the course of your answer to that question, you've touched upon the absence of um, consistent institutionalized archiving in the Arab world for the work of many of these designers. And your own travels and research are a testament to that because so much of what you gathered you gathered from private authors. So are there exceptions to this, to this picture? And what are the implications of this broad absence? I mean, what, how does graphic design then relate to identity and memory? Can you uh, talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, but we we were lucky to find uh, a few archives, uh, one, two in Beirut and actually a few in Cairo. So the two in Beirut were uh, Aboudi Abu Jaudi's archive and the archive at the American University in Beirut. And in Cairo, we really tapped into the uh, American University in Cairo archive, which was quite um, extensive. We have a really very good rare book um, collection uh, archive that has older magazines and we have donations, uh, generous donations by many uh, um, designers and uh, cartoonists and calligraphers. So we were able to also document a few work from there. Uh, but Haysam, um, we also had institutions um, that we reached out to in Cairo, right? Some of the archives were belonged actually to um, yes. publishing. Yeah, we Yes, we did uh, use uh, Al Hilal, Dail Hilal, uh, and those Al Yusuf uh, archives. Uh, also, the Haram, the archive of the Haram. I mean, not much of visual examples we use, but we used for a lot of the data, the information we needed. For and, and it was it was useful. I, I, unfortunately, I'm sad to 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 report that these archives are not. Um, properly kept, they're not easy to access, they are a bit uh, out of order, uh, they, they need a lot of patience with the bureaucracy of accessing them, so that's also the, bu the bureaucracy of it is a, is a challenge, but we are lucky that there are a few institutions who um, are taking care of this, but we mentioned this earlier and we will keep mentioning it that really the amount of material that we found, and Nadia, you know that we told you uh, the selection process of the images was very hard. Um, mm -hmm. we, we, we only have 20 to 30 percent of what we found in the book in terms of images, and uh, mm -hmm. it was a very tough. We can complain now. Cutting for... down. <laughs> yeah, we can complain. <laughs> I mean, complain. <laughs> I don't think it's Nadia's fault. And the end, the book has has like it can't be heavier than a certain weight. How much does it weigh now? Like a kilo and a half? I think that was the maximum for yeah, this book. Really, she was the one communicating with us. No, 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 no. We cannot. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I suppose we have maybe time for one more question and then we can uh, start uh, open the floor. There, there's some questions in the Q&A uh, that we can start uh, looking at. So um, my last question is, uh, what is the role of collaboration in graphic design? Um, you know, in, in publishing, it's, you know, people speak of, of authorship as being a, a group effort. It's you, 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 you uh, write on the, sh you build on the shoulders of others, or you do research based on that of others. So in graphic design, um, is, is, do you think that a lot depends on the individual graphic designer, or is it a more collaborative effort? Um, I don't know what you think. Yeah, I think design by in its nature is, is a team, is teamwork. A designer doesn't work in, vo in, in, a vo in a void, unlike art where even art, you need to collaborate with a gallery, with a curator, but on maybe a smaller, more limited level. But for a designer, you have on one hand, a client who has to communicate an idea with an audience. And then there, there is also a production, a production process. So by the nature of the craft, designers need to work in teams. You, can, you cannot work on your own. You have to work with, um, first of all, you have to understand your audience so that you can design for the audience. And you have to understand what your client wants so that you can communicate this idea from the client to the audience. So a designer is like a translator. So a translator of ideas uh, visually, is a visual translator of ideas, more or less. Hey, Sam? So yeah, I just had a, com a problem with the internet. Uh, Nadia Malish, can you repeat your question again? I know that uh, the like question was, the what is the role of collaboration in graphic design? Oh, yes, to sorry. what extent is graphic design a collaborative effort instead of the work of just one person? 
yeah, I mean, or, or we can tell the result is our book. That's a, the, the, that's a, the easy translation of, 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 of what the, the easy translation of the word collaboration. But also, I think nowadays it's very difficult to work alone. Work needs to be collectively. I mean, people, they complete each other when they work together. And uh, we said it in, in, in Arabic, as you know, uh, two brains is much better than one brain. So, and, and when you are or even more. So the idea of, I think with people, when they work together, they are much more uh, richer. And I don't believe of, the, of the actually the idea of uh, individual work. I mean, I, from, from a researcher point of view, I don't see it really, what's the point? If we are actually doing a research collectively, for sure, we will bring much more uh, out than when somebody is working alone. And of course, I mean, not, not necessarily like, like a team it could be many people, everybody could contribute differently, but, uh, uh, but at, the, at the end, it's a collaborative work, it's not an individual work. So I believe in, in, in teamwork. But, but I also want to build on your question uh, relating to design and identity. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a, very, a very important idea for us to quickly reflect on before we start taking questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we design is like the invisible represent, representative of culture. We take it for granted because we interact with it so intimately every day. We read books, we see signs on the street. We use it to get from A to B because without signage, you get lost. Um, even the design of the letters themselves, the typography, we take it for granted, but this is design. So it's almost like the invisible um, structure of things is, is there. But uh, it's also an, a really important platform uh, uh, of um, visual representation of that identity. And I love the period of the 50s and the 60s and the post-colonial um, time in the Arab world when the designers and artists and publishers were all looking for what is Arab identity? Is it Islamic? Is it ancient Egyptian? Is it uh, Phoenician? Is it uh, the West? So this, there was this melange of ideas that was emerging and cooking and it was such a rich period of experimentation. I, I feel like the most interesting work visually um, in our part of the world was emerging when these big questions were being asked. What, the, what is Arab identity? Who are we today? And what is the conversation that we are engaging with in the world, with the world? So uh, usually some, one of the interesting questions we, we had is, was there a modern, postmodern um, uh, Arab design period? So in comparative to, to the West, and uh, we, I mean, the reply was, of course, there was, we had designers engaging uh, internationally, as you saw some of their work, you can definitely see uh, some of it is psychedelic influenced, op art, modernist, these influences were trickling in. Uh, but also more importantly, we were looking at what is our identity as Arabs, um, how can you visualize uh, who you are? And this is what graphic design was trying to do or is still to, to, till today trying to do. Okay, uh, thank you, Bahia and Haytham, for that uh, wonderful presentation or wonderful uh, Q&A. I'll just uh, take a selection of questions uh, from the audience. So uh, the first question is, what is the difference between graphic design and visual art? And this yes. is from uh, Ala Abu Naji. Thank you, Ala, for the question. I'll, it's Haytham, if you let me. Uh, start with this one because uh, Haysam and myself we're both practicing artists so we can easily tell you the difference. Um, art is reflective so art you have the luxury of saying this is my idea and this is how I'm looking at the world and this is my interpretation of this idea in any medium whether a digital art or uh, uh, painting or sculpture the mediums varies but it is the summary of the learning and the and the ideas of only the artist. There's, there is selfishness in the art. Uh, artists have to be a bit selfish because they're, they're contemplating their ideas and they're presenting their ideas. Designers are communicators and we have to communicate 
a message. It's not, we're not doing design because it's nice or it's pretty. No, a, a, a typography has to be legible because people driving on a highway with a speed of, I don't know, 120 kilometers, they have to read your sign quickly. So there is a science to it. It's not just a, an interpretation or an emotion or an experiment in a medium. Uh, it has, so design is part art, part science. Just to sum it up, Haysam, would you like to okay. build on that? I will just add to this because the, this, this question is very old. I mean, the, to define what is not before the art and design and what is art and what is design, it goes back to, I don't know, 15th century, 16th century, when we talk about uh, applied and fine art. But I will not go that back. It just, uh, uh, first of all, it's design is about functionality. So something is actually function. Art, not necessary to be function. It could be just like uh, when, again, art was mostly talking about fine art. It's need not, there's no necessity to be functional. So at, at the moment we speak, there is no really differentiation so much between art. Many of the artists, they exhibit the art project within a, a design context and vice versa. Some of the art project, they are actually functional. They are actually products that could be working. And many examples in the modern art and from uh, 50s and 60s until, until today, they are actually a art project, but they are uh, in uh, considered designs. So, uh, but not to confuse everyone, we try in our book. We try to get into more the traditional definition of of, uh, of graphic design. Okay, uh, I have a question from uh, Amanda Horton. Thank you to the authors for all your hard work. It was a really lovely book. I had the pleasure of writing a review of it for a journal. My question is, what is next for you two, specifically in terms of historical research and or sharing this important research with others? Um, thank you, Amanda, for the lovely question. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in looking for the women designers, actually, because <laughs> it's, I feel like we need to write about the women designers of the Arab world. We, we know that they existed. Unfortunately, we only have five women mentioned in the book that we were able to find and represent their work. We know that the women exist. They just need, we'd hear that they designed, but we couldn't find it. So I think the priority for me is I, I want to find the women designers of the Arab world. This to me is a pro, top, top personal priority. Heysa? At the moment, I um, actually am I'm, I'm researching few uh, like few subjects related to the field. So one of them is, uh, is related to the um, uh, an African definition of design. So good, going back to uh, what is design from an African point of view, uh, not again, back to the Western definition of design. There is another definition that comes from Africa. So I'm looking for this, like trying to answer this question with it's a collaborative work with different uh, scholars from, from the continent, from Africa. And another book about uh, scripts of Egypt, which is related to um, um, from a historical point of view, until modern time, all different scripts were being used in the visual communication context. So how from hieroglyphics and uh, demotic erotic until Arabic, like Greek and Armenian and, and Syriac, all scripts within Egypt, how do we use in, in, in graphic design and visual communication? So that's the most two projects that I'm working on now. Thank you. Um, Mona Amir asks, how does the Arabic language compared to other languages uh, uniquely impact graphic design in terms of the artistic or technical practical aspect? Is there something about the language itself, which, yeah. I, I'm going to talk about the script because uh, I mean, the language communicates uh, a content, but the script communicates emotions and the shape of the script communicates emotions. And to us, we are very lucky because uh, we have such a long, rich history of Arabic calligraphy uh, on so many things that are, that are all around us, on monuments, on carpets, on lanterns. Um, and this was a great inspiration for designers throughout history. They always revisited um, the scripts historically, reinterpreted them, reutilized them, and use them in their designs. So we are very lucky in that sense. But then you add the technology and then you have the need arose for type design. 
And then again, another wave of creativity ensued and you have all these designers who were trying now to design for digital platforms and create new visual solutions on what is Arabic on a digital uh, sphere. So um, calligraphy uh, and then the, the printing press and the decline in calligraphy and then typography, we have a really nice wave of uh, and big variety of different scri uh, scripts in Arabic that really were enriched the visual culture in all of our uh, communication historically. Thank you. Okay. Um... We have a question from Eric Hartman. Do you think there's a fusion of design with the current trends in architecture? I don't know if, if did you hear that? Sorry. Do you think there is a fusion of graphic design with current trends in architecture? I don't know how you would. Um, I, I'm not sure. I feel like there is, if I look at uh, Islamic monuments historically, if I go, um, walk down this Moaz street and I look at the scripts on the buildings, there is so much harmony, there's so much beauty, everything works together. I cannot say that it's the case right now. I feel like there is a huge, a huge, um, we are actually suffering from visual pollution because of how uh, detached uh, the script is from it and the buildings are from their locality and their identity. I think we can write a whole book about that. So it's, it's a new research. I, I can answer a little bit different because I think maybe she, she got it from my historical point of view, but honestly speaking, the, the define of design, like nowadays, I don't see the part which is like it differentiate between graphic uh, or uh, design for architecture for like uh, exterior or interior spaces. So you have design and and then you can design for 2D or 3D and two dimensional, three dimensional. And historically it was designed partially as like use of the facades and so on. If you talk about our like, for example, Arabic calligraphy or ornaments or uh, uh, or other elements, but now if you want to really think in three-dimensional space, which could, might be a product design or could be uh, designed for interior spaces like or spatial design or from exterior. So some of the other, again, I will refer to one of the Western school, which is a Bauhaus. You, again, you can always have design. You cannot differentiate. It's just like you see it differently. And that's my 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 answer to it. Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, Teresa Barger, I hope that's the right pronunciation, asks, says, when Kamal Bulata was trying to learn to drive in his late 30s in Washington, he said he did not understand how people could drive. When I try to drive, I see how beautiful this tree is, how beautiful that hedge is, how beautiful that yield sign is, and I keep crashing. So how can people look and drive at the same time, look and drive too? is the question <laughs> this is a beautiful story thank you so much for sharing it's so it's so beautiful it's i think something kamal would say yes <laughs> um i think we have a, a couple of questions which we've answered already um Uh, slightly broad question, Bayan Saif, how, how do you think the exile experiences affected Arab designers in terms of identity and creativity? How is the experience? Yes, thank you, Bayan. This is a great, this is a great question. Thank you. We tapped, I mean, we touched on uh, the idea of uh, the diaspora and uh, we, we, I don't know if we communicated clearly that uh, we started with the Palestinian uh, condition and then people started moving out of the the area and then moving into new countries and trying to settle in into into new communities and the Palestinian uh, condition um, we have the one of the best resources with that I forgot to mention is the Palestinian poster archive which is a digital archive of all of the Palestinian uh, posters that were created um, um, I mean for decades so in, in a way, the case study in Palestine, which later then the civil war in Lebanon, you had another wave of migration, and then you had the invasion of Iraq, you had another wave of migration, and now Syria, another wave of migration. So this repeated 
as a condition of living in the diaspora has been really um, uh, is integral in our book because first we thought that we want to write a book about the geography of people living in the geography of the Arab world and then we discovered that it's really impossible to just neglect the designers of the diaspora because they were so in touch and so connected I mean they were physically out of the Arab world but their hearts and minds were here and they were working and producing design work for the Arab world, even when they were living in Europe and the US. So th this is why in our, our book, we have a whole part on uh, designers of the diaspora and we really um, build on that idea extensively in the book. Okay, um, I think that brings us to the end of our uh, webinar. Um, I wanted to, I think there was uh, one, uh, Oh, it's gone now. <laughs> it's disappeared. Uh, I just had, uh, uh, I think Wafa Wali was just thanking you for, for, for a wonderful book and a wonderful discussion. So um, I want to thank Bahia and Haytham for this fascinating discussion. I want to thank the development office in New York who invited me to moderate this. And I want to thank uh, our viewers for their wonderful questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Bahia. Thank you, Haitham and Nadia for this wonderful presentation. And sorry if we couldn't get to all of the questions. Please know that this video is being recorded or this presentation is being recorded and we will have it available for all of you who have registered. And uh, we wish everyone the best of luck, especially the authors, Bahia and Haitham, on continuing their journey, especially in terms of researching more women graphic designers. There were many questions related to that. Thank you all again and see you during the next webinar.